Good morning. It's so good to be here with you guys today as we're kicking off a brand new sermon series called Nourished, and it's about taking care of ourselves and our body, soul, and spirit. I'll get into that in just a second, but I do want to give a big shout out to Herman and Amy. Y'all did an amazing job preaching last Sunday on Mother's Day. You guys just, what a tag team. You do a marvelous job and such truths and great meaty things to talk about, but you're also funny and just so relational. We just love you guys. Great job. Thanks for giving me a Sunday off. And then the pizza. It was so much fun last Sunday. Uh, I was supposed to be off and I was off. Actually, last Sunday, I sat at home with Tina Hayden Hayes and for Mother's Day and we watched the sermon uh, from home. But then I came in to be part of giving the pizza away because I just wanted to see pe- uh, people. And it was so interesting watching our people pull up and some of them would just start crying and uh, they didn't care about the pizza. They wanted to see our people, and it was just a big love fest. And so, Herman and Amy, great job with your leadership on that. So today we're going to kick off a brand new sermon series called Nourished. And uh, I'm going to walk, I want to read a passage to you before I do anything else. And this is one of the Psalms, Psalm 42. And I want to read this to you and, and then and talk about the soul of a man, because the Bible talks about that we are made of spirit, soul, and body. And within the soul is our mind, our will, and our emotions. And so today I'm going to be talking about mental me. I'm going to be talking about our mental health and then separate that from our emotional health. We talk about our emotional health pretty, rare, pretty regularly here at New Covenant through inner healing. But I also want to talk about our mental health. And um, so before I get in, I'll read the passage first. Let's just go ahead and read the passage. Now, Psalm 42 is a passage that was written by the sons of Korah. There's, uh, I think, 11 psalms that were written by the sons of Korah. And th- that's really interesting to me because, if you'll remember, Korah was like the nephew of Moses, and, and he staged a rebellion against Moses. And the Lord uh, brought judgment and opened up the earth, swallowed Korah, his family, and those who were rebelling with him. But some of his sons were saved. And these sons of Korah actually worked in the tabernacle, taking care of some of the supplies of the tabernacle. And they became uh, uh, worshipers, they became psalmists, they became worship leaders. And it's so cool to see that the sons of, uh, of a man who died in a rebellion were still allowed in the house of the Lord. A new generation emerged. A, a, a people were set apart that we are not doomed to what our fathers and our mothers have given us. We're not doomed to a family name. We're not doomed uh, to any circumstance in our life. God uses people, individuals, to do the things he wants them to do. And the sons of Korah are beautiful pictures of that. So here we go. Psalm 42. As a deer pants for flowing streams, so pants my soul for you, O God. Isn't that beautiful? If you can imagine a deer that's been running and a little out of breath and, and, and needs some water and it finds a brook and, and then it begins to drink from that brook and, 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 and these sons of Korah are writing this saying, Lord, as that deer needs that water, needs that water to live. And as that water refreshes and replenishes, that's what it's like for my soul, my mind, my will, and my emotions when I enter into your presence. My soul thirsts for God. For the living God, when shall I come and appear before God? And in this passage, they're saying there's a distance somehow. Maybe the, the psalmist is, is with David on run from Saul or, or Absalom, or maybe, but they're far away and they're saying, I, I can't quite get to you right now, God. I, I want to get back to you. And then this one says, my tears have been my food day and night while they say to me all the day long, where is your God? There's enemies out there questioning, uh, where is God? You're in a hard season. How can you say that your God is for you when, when you're in the middle of a hard season and he could rescue you right now if he wanted to? Have you ever heard that before? And then think about this passage. These things I remember as I pour out my soul. I just remember this one big lesson. It's okay if you bring all of you in front of all of them. They're not threatened. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit is not threatened by you having competing feelings in your heart, competing thoughts in your life. Uh, They don't want just your strength. They want your weaknesses too. They want all of you in front of all of them. These things I remember as I pour out my soul, how I would go with the throng and lead them in procession to the house of God. With glad shouts and songs of praise, a multitude-keeping festival. Wow. This passage probably has never been read with this emphasis before in the history of mankind until right now. 
how I used to go with the throngs and lead them in procession into the house of God with, with victorious shouts. And I, I know our world right now is looking, when can we come back and gather together as the family of God? When are we going to come back to the house of God? And think about the sons of Korah. They were not, didn't just go to the house of God to worship. They worked there. This, is, this was their life. Their life revolved around the tabernacle. And, and they're, they're grieving because they can't be together. They're grieving that their, their life has been upset. And suddenly they're, they're stuck in the, and you can feel the pain. It's the same thing we're experiencing now. The church is not a service on Sunday morning. The church is not a building. The church is Christian relationships around Jesus Christ and the body serving the body. But it's so much more difficult when we can't touch one another, when we can't sing with each other, when we can't look at each other and be together. And, and, and so that's what these sons of Korah are saying is, in this season, there's been a disruption in my life. Now my soul is crying out, I'm not doing good. I'm, I'm not thriving. I, I'm not singing all the praises. And my son, Caleb, said to me, Dad, he says, Dad, in this season, we've got to find our praise. He says, one day we will die and go to heaven, and we will involuntarily praise just because it's a natural expression of seeing Christ face to face. But can you give him praise in this circumstance and in this season? Because this is when it matters. Can you find your praise in this season? And the sons of Korah are singing a song of worship to God and at the same time mourning the grief they're feeling internally. Why are you cast down, O my soul, and why are you in turmoil within me? Hope in God, for I shall again praise him, my salvation. And my God, my soul is cast down with me, therefore I remember you. From the land of Jordan and Hermon and Mount Mazar, right here what the sons of Korah are doing are reminding themselves of how God showed up to them at these different places in their journey. Uh, sometimes when we look forward, we can get hopeless. We can, uh, sadness, there can be depression. Sometimes we don't see the path to get back to a life that's thriving and flourishing. And sometimes we have to look back at the faithfulness of God, that he has been faithful over and over and over. He was faithful into Jordan. He was faithful at Hermon. He was faithful at Mount Mazar. We can look forward into the future and know he will be faithful because he's proven it to us already. Deep calls to deep. I believe one of the words of this season is God is wanting to take us deep. He wants to take us deeper than we've ever been before. And, and he wants us to know him, not know about him, but to know him. Not what a preacher told you about him, not what a book told you about him. He wants you to know him. Deep calls to deep. At the roar of your waterfall, all your breakers and your ways have gone over me. By day, the Lord commands his steadfast love. And at night, his song is with me, a prayer to the God of my life. I say to God, my rock, why have you forgotten me? Why do I go mourning because of the oppression of my enemy? As with a deadly wound in my bones, my adversaries taunt me while they say to me all the day long, where is your God? And when I say this to you, a lot of people are fighting against the government policies, procedures, and not recognizing that the real question is, where is God in all this? It, it, that, that's the key thing. Where is God in this season of our life? I'm not spinning a ton of my energy focusing on external circumstances and rules and people. I am focusing on where is the eternal God and what is his purpose for me and for his people in this season? Because if we can find that, the circumstances may change, but, it, it, but we will still thrive in this season because we are walking with the Lord who already knew what we were going to walk into when this pandemic began. And then finally, in the last verse, it says, Why are you cast down on my soul? And why are you in turmoil within me? Hope in God, for I shall again praise him, my salvation and my God. The sons of Korah have the guts to start with pain and walk through all that they're struggling and dealing with internally, with discouragement, externally. So I want to talk today about uh, mental me, and I want to use this blurb for this sermon series because when I read this, I almost pushed back. I almost argued with this thought because it's not been my reality. And Parker Palmer said, self-care is never a selfish act. It is simply good stewardship of the only gift I have, the gift I was put on earth to offer others. Anytime we can listen to true self and give it the care it requires, we do it not only for ourselves, 
but for the many others' lives we touch. Today, I want to talk about mental me. And as I get ready to talk about this, I've got some um, disclaimers I want to use this morning. So a couple of weeks ago, uh, uh, we were praying as a staff, and then we were starting to plan. I said, what do we need to say in this season? It feels like we're going to be on lockdown for, for uh, another month or so. What, what do we want to say to our congregation? What is it that the Lord is speaking to his people? And, 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 and how are we going to respond and help our people to thrive in this season? And so as we were doing that, uh, this idea came up about nourishment. It came up about how do we help our people self-feed, get in the word for themselves, pray for themselves. How do we help them do their own transforming you, their own inner healing? How do we help them have a deeper relationship with God than they've ever had before? How do we get the church and all of its programs and ministries, which are good, out of the way so that they can go face-to-face like King David, like Moses did with God, and have some anchors drilled down into their soul in this season. And as we were talking about that, we decided that we would do this sermon series called Nourished and about how to care for yourself, so your spirit, your body, your soul, your mind. And, and when we were done putting all that together, I, I, I just said, hey, I got a question I need to ask about this sermon series. And they said, what? And I said, uh, uh, who's going to preach it? I don't have anything to say about that. I mean, this is one of the greatest weaknesses of my life. I mean, how am I? And they said, no, but you're, you're, you're the pastor. You're the preacher. You've got to preach this. I'm like, but I'm horrible at this. I'm not good at this. I'm going to share some stuff with you today, but I'm not sharing it with you from a place of strength. I'm sharing it with a place of weakness. I'm struggling. I'm not doing well in this season. I'm struggling with depression, sadness, loss. Um, it's not been an easy season for me. And, and, and this week, you know, talking about mental health and trying to figure this out, could it be that the Lord could bring one of the greatest breakthroughs in my life in one of the darkest seasons? And um, as a pastor, we don't get to just preach parts of the Bible. We have to preach the full counsel of the Word of God. And sometimes that means we have to talk about weakness, not just our strengths. So if I could unpack for just let me have a five minutes to sort of set the stage, then I'll try to take us somewhere that might help you. But I want you to understand, I do not understand how all this works. I am not preaching to you from a place of experience. But I am processing with you some things Papa's working with me on right now that might help you in the long run. So a couple of weeks ago, Jenny Murray, our worship pastor, had said, Hey, boss, I need a mental health week. I I am change fatigued. We are making changes every day at church, and we're making changes every day as as I homeschool my kids. not have to focus on the church piece. Uh, She also mentioned that moms never get a day off, so uh, unless you can give your kids away for a day, so they can limit a little bit of what they do at home, but she was needing a week to be away from the uh, the church. And and when she said that, I I mentioned that to to Blake, our executive pastor, and I also mentioned to our elders. And when I mentioned to our elders, I want to give a big shout out to our elders. Our elders normally meet once a month, and in this pandemic, they have met every single Monday night. They meet for prayer on Monday morning. They meet for, for elders meeting on Monday night. And, uh, and they voted to give all of our staff a, a mental health bonus. One week that doesn't count against vacation, just one week in this pandemic to not have to come to the church house, not carry responsibilities here, and try to breathe and catch a little bit of some mental health on the week that they are off. So my mental health week was this past week, and uh, Herman and Abby, I appreciate them so much preaching so that I didn't have to preach, and I, they fed my soul. I mean, it was so good. I was so proud of them. I was watching Herman and Amy preach, and I was watching uh, Jenny and Chip help lead worship, and I was watching Emily and Blake do coffee chats, and I just, oh, it felt so good that I did such a great job. So this last week was my mental health week. And I really didn't even know what I was going to do for my mental health week. I had some stuff the house that had to get done. I had some taxes and financial stuff I had to get done. And um, as it happened, um, Tina's mom passed away this week. And that sort of hijacked the week as it should, because life and death things should hijack our life. And um, Joyce Ann Davis went home to be with the Lord just a couple of days ago. And I just want to give a shout out to her because the first word that comes to my mind when I think about Joyce is she's sweet. She's sweet all day long. 
Joyce is the type of person that uh, was very amicable, doesn't like to fight, doesn't like disagreement. She's a peacemaker. She just wants everybody to be together and everybody to be, uh, enjoy their life with one another. Uh, she had a real weakness for Hayden Luke uh, for doing his homework last minute with him. Uh, Hayden Luke would, uh, would wait till they had a three month project and he would wait till uh, the, the day before it was due. And then he'd holler out to me or Tina to see if we would jump in and save him. And we would say no. So he would call Nana. He would call Nana, and Nana, who's not concerned about discipline and training him up in character and making him pay the price for not doing his work, Nana would always jump in and say, come on over here, and I'll help you do your homework. We'll get this thing done. They'd stay up half the night. She was that kind of woman that would sacrificially help people. She, was, she had a rough life. She had a lot of trauma. She had a lot of bad things that happened in her world, and she kept her sweetness all the way to the end. And now today she is in heaven with her Savior, and she's in heaven with her daughter Leanne. And so I give a big shout-out to, um, to Nana. We also, um, I also had another loss this week. Our trainer at the gym was, died tragically this week, a young woman. And um, our gym family is grieving together. And so in this, in this time of pandemic, in this time of mental health, on one end, I want to be bitter that I did not get my mental health week because that's what happens when we go low in our mental health, resentment, bitterness, unforgiveness, uh, rejection, we push people away from ourselves, that are, those are normal byproducts of us struggling and being low on our, our mental tank or emotional tank. On the other hand, I'm so grateful that I did not come in here Sunday, Monday, Tuesday and give all my energy away in activities and have nothing to give my family and my friends or myself at the back end of this season. So I say all that to say that I'm coming to you raw, I'm coming to you real, I'm relying on my notes today because I want to make sure that I give this subject of mental health, mental wellness, mental wholeness, uh, it's just due. So my, I, I was born, I don't know how this works, but for some reason, I was born into the collective. And I've mentioned that to you before, that my life has been about if I have anything that somebody else needs, they can have it. Uh, that, 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 that I don't know, I didn't have boundaries. I don't understand how all this works, but I, I did not have boundaries. So I didn't have a, an awareness of this is mine, that is yours. Uh, that's your problem, not my problem. You have to fix your own problem. I can help you, but it's not my problem. So I, I, I didn't have that mechanism that separated me from everybody else. I belong to the collective, so any problem with the collective was also my problem. In fact, then after you know my childhood, I, I go into the Marine Corps, and we were trained unit first. So you take care of the needs of your unit, then you take care of your own needs. And, and that was just the way we were trained. And, and there's, a, there's, a sign, uh, there's a sign I pass by every single day, and every day I look at it, and, um, and I decided to use it in this sermon. The sign says, selfish or selfless, you decide. That sign is a truth and a lie that has hovered over my head my whole life. If you're not being selfless, you're automatically being selfish. So in my attempt to not be a selfish person, I have accidentally been selfless. I believe there's a third option, and it's called self-love. I, I believe that God said, called us to love God with all of our heart, mind, and soul, to love our neighbor, and to love ourselves. And I don't think there's very many churches that are teaching people how to love themselves, the beautiful creation that God has made us to be. I don't think there's very many people saying, you know what, you should be fascinated by you. It's okay to, to be fascinated by the creation that was so precious to God that he sent his son to die for you. What about self-love? Because here's the thing, if I'm not operating from self-love, then my, I'm getting depleted in my energy. And when I get depleted in my energy, I avoid people. I, I pull back from people. I have left to offer people. When I'm at my best, my tank is full, and I'm looking for people to love as Jesus would love them. And so somewhere along the line, I didn't get the teaching on self-love. I, I, I missed that. So I've been operating that that option wasn't even out there. So now I'm either selfish or selfless. And I tried to choose to be selfless instead of being selfish. But I think that there's that, that other option of self-love. And that's some of the things I'm going to talk about today. So here we go. I got four points today. And um, 
and, and I want to share this definition about mental health. Um, what does it mean in mental health? Mental health is the ability to understand and process what you're experiencing. It's the ability to maintain focus and have energy to make good decisions. Okay, this is not a feeling. I'm going to separate emotions as feelings, and I'm going to separate mental health as thinking. It, it is the ability to process what you've experienced and information that's happening right now to be able to deal with a stress so that you can focus and make good decisions for our lives. And, it's, it's, and I'll give you a couple examples of, of how that works, but we're going to separate the, 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 the mental side, the thinking side away from the heart and the emotional side. Mental me, point number one, mental me, what's it like to be me mentally? <laughs> You don't want to know. Um, what's it like to be me mentally is the thinking, doing side of our lives. Okay, the thinking, doing side of our lives. So sometimes you will hear professionals talk about mental health issues and behavioral health treatment options at the same time because your mental health dictates your behavioral issues. And so I remember one time that uh, I, I, 20 years ago, 20 years ago, I had one conversation with Frank Harvey, Dr. Frank Harvey, my pastor, that changed my life. Just, just, I, just this one conversation. One day I was talking to him. I said, well, Frank, you know what I think? He says, uh, I always know what you think. He says, you always tell me what you think. And I said, what do you mean? He says, you never tell me how you feel. You always tell me what you think. I said, what do you mean? He said, look at your language. He said, every time we have a conversation, you say, this is what I think. You always come from your brain first and tell me what you think. But there are other people that answer my questions. If I was to say we're going to have church on Sunday, I would say I think that's a good idea because that's when everybody else does church. Other people would say I feel like that's a good idea because Sunday's a good day of rest and be with your people. There are thinkers and there are feelers. So like this week when I learned of these two deaths three hours apart from each other, uh, that wave of emotion, that wave of uncertainty, that wave of everything's different now. My immediate response is to go to my brain and say, okay, who needs to know? Who needs to be told? How do I respond publicly? How, who do I need to reach out to? My brain thinks about the order of which things have to be handled. And then two weeks later, when the storm has cleared, then a wave will hit me of regret, of loss, of sadness. Um, but I think first, and I usually feel secondly. And um, Dr. Harvey taught me that about myself. So over the last 20 years, I, I do an experiment. I, this is how I try. I want to be able to connect and relate to every person in my world. So I listen to people's conversation. And if they say to me, I feel, I try to tell Uh, strategy called mirroring. Mirroring is, is reflecting back to the person in front of you what they just said or what they're doing. So sometimes if I'm in a, a high stress conversation, maybe a confrontation or, or, or something like that, I mirror the other person's body language. If, if, if they're leaning in, I lean in. Uh, if, if they're sitting up straight, I sit up straight. If their hands are on the table, I'll put my hand. I want them to see that I'm actively trying to engage and be with them in this circumstance. I also, a, a Nickism, we've been talking about Nickisms lately. One of my Nickisms is I will say back to you what I heard you say was, and I always repeat back either what the person's actual words were or what I thought they were trying to say. And in that mirroring, I'm trying to affirm them that what they have to say is important. I'm listening and they're being heard. And, and so I started, when people say, I think this, I try to tell them what I think. And they say, I feel this, I try to tell them what I feel. It's just a piece of being able to be in the circumstance. You're, again, mental health is being able to uh, process experiences and information in a way that alleviates stress and keeps your focus so that you can make good decisions. So when I talk about feelings and emotions, we'll probably talk about that next week. This week, I'm just talking about our mental capacity and what does it mean to, to, to have good mental health. Um, you know, we're, we're, we're just a couple weeks ago uh, on the news was the story of Ahmaud Aubrey who was shot, an African-American young man who was shot by two white men. 
and, and those two white men had been looking for someone who had been breaking into houses, breaking into cars. So they were looking for someone. They were engaging. They were on patrol. They, they were, they, they were, they were uh, 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 aggressively and assertively looking for someone. And so when, when they saw uh, Mr. Aubrey, they, they were already geared up to capture, to catch, to do something. And then in that quick moment, he was shot and dead. And see, the thing is, is racism didn't just happen that day. Racism was the act. Murder was the act that had begun long ago in thoughts and ideas about people of a different color. Racism is taught to people. We know that our thoughts become behaviors, and behaviors become habits, and habits become lifestyles. And so as we talk about mental health, the person who has been rejected by a man or mistreated by a man, that information, if not processed well, will end up becoming behaviors that we demonstrate that continue to reinforce the fact that for us, men are bad and they will treat us badly. So I say all those things because the psalmist, I'm sorry, in Proverbs, it says, for as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. So mental health is the thinking, doing side of our life. Number two, mental me involves managing the inputs and the outputs of my life. So I'm going to go at this a different angle. Those of you who have heard me talk about inputs and the outputs, not doing that today. I'm going to do something totally different. So in this season, um, so in my previous season, I, 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 I was like, I'd go to the fig tree and I'd pray with my tribe. I'd pray with my people and somebody else was leading worship and creating an open heaven for me and I didn't have to do any work for it. And then prayer people would be in there sharing revelation with each other and encouraging everybody. In this season, I am hided, hided, not hiding, I'm hidden away. <laughs> uh, I'm hidden away at a solitary location where there is no noise, complete silence, no people, no tribe. I am locked away in solitude. I'm not comfortable in silence. My buddy, my friend, I love you, Brian Cagle. Brian Cagle, he'll stand up to preach and he'll make a point and he'll pause for 10 seconds and not say a word. I start sweating while he waits 10 seconds before he makes his next point. I do not like silence. If you give me a nanosecond of silence in a conversation, I will feel, heck, I'll start before you get to the second. I, that's, this is the way I do a conversation. So for does this silence to sit for an hour in silence before the Lord is brand new to me. But in this season, there are some adjustments. So watch this. One of the things that I'm doing in this season, if, if indeed mental health is our thinking and doing, then what are we thinking about and what are we actually doing right now? Then, then we have to look at our inputs and our outputs. Number one, I am limiting some of the inputs in my life. I am limiting news to 30 minutes or less in my day. That's all I've got mental capacity for, to listen to the news for 30 minutes or less. I, need, I used to not even watch the news. I, I knew what was going on by social media and people's conversations. But in this season, as a leader, and the uncertainty, and the sons of Issachar should know the times in which they live, I am watching the news for no more than 30 minutes a day because I'm protecting my mental capacity by not watching the news. Because most of the news is fear-based, and it is fear-based to scare the fire out of us, and then they throw on a happy story at the very end. That's, that's what they do. They start with the scariest thing first. They keep your fear up for 28 minutes, and the last two minutes, they'll tell you a happy story. So that's the strategy, that's the model. So I, I try to pay attention. The first 15 minutes of the national news and then maybe go on the internet, pull up a couple stories, I'm limiting that. In the old season, I measured everything by the outputs of my life. I measured my life by what I got done, what I got accomplished, how much of the Bible did I read, how much time did I spend. So that's the kind of things I was measuring the output of my life. But it seems like Papa went after productivity as one of the things in our lives that he wanted to deal with. So in this season, I'm not measuring my outputs. I'm measuring my inputs. I'm measuring the time I spend alone with him. I'm measuring how many hours I spend in the Eno reading a spy book. I'm measuring how much time I spend out in the garden or building a fire and, and sitting and reading next to the fire. 
I, I don't have a lot of outputs that I can look to in this season and, and, and measure success. So for my mental health in this season, I'm trying to measure inputs, things that would bring peace, things that would bring rest, things that would help me reflect on my life. What if, what if? That we're not going back to the way things were. What, what needs to change in my life for the next 50 years that was not, that's, brought, that's not brought me joy in the past 50 years? So in the season, I'm paying attention to my mental health, what lifes me, what drains me, all those things, because it's the thinking, doing piece of our life, which means we have to pay attention to our input, output. What are the outputs of our past season that we took pride in? What were the things in our outputs that we looked at and said, that's who I am, and we put our identity in? I want to help us real quick. Church world, church world, pause for a second. Please listen to me, please. As some people fight to go back to church, fight to gather again, I just want to just throw this one revelation, one truth to you. Before we get back, think about this. Anything, God wants you to know his presence. He wants you to know him and have relationship with him. If you need a church building and service to find his presence, it's an idol to you. So what happened with the Israelites is they would create something that wasn't God, but help them to find God. And they needed it as a crutch to have relationship with God. What has happened in this season is people have made a building and a service on Sunday morning their, their prop to be able to get to God. And God has kicked that prop away. They've made an idol, a, represent, a, a building that represented the presence of God, but isn't the presence of God. And God has shut the building down and said, you can still have my presence and not need a preacher, not need a building, not need a service. I'm here just for you. And he's dealt with that idol. And if we rush back as a church to have services again, and we don't deal with that idolatry, I think, that's, I think we're going to fail the benefits we could have got out of this season. There's many ways we can thrive in this season. All right, number three. Now let's get to some practical stuff. Mental me is where we steward our energy. We steward our, did you know, I love that Parker uh, quote I just read a minute again, because it talks about that, that, that the only thing you have to offer the world is yourself. And if you don't care for yourself, you can't give to the world what the Lord intended to give for you. Oh, Jesus, you're going to make me, ha, ah, okay, so, ah, all right. Part of the problem here is this religious spirit thing that has taught us a horrible truth. Now watch this for just a second. There is a, a scripture that is used in the Bible, but it's used through a religious spirit to put condemnation on you in an unnecessary burden. Pick up your cross and follow me. You must deny yourself. You must lay yourself, lay your life down, okay? Th 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 those are scriptures that Jesus talked about, all right? Those are passages of scripture Jesus talked about. So well-meaning people preaching the Bible have said, you exist to lay your life down every day and to die and to suffer and to sacrifice. Your job is to die to yourself so that Jesus can live. No, no. Jesus died so that you could live. He already died so that you could have life and life abundantly and life eternally. And there's too many people running around trying to figure out how to die more instead of how to live more. <sighs> Thank you, those in the room who are cheering me on. I mean, I've heard more sermons by pastors about how to die well than how to live well. I mean, God didn't make me firewood to slowly burn on the fire for his joy and pleasure. He made me his child to run and explore and delight. And there are, there are seasons of sacrifice. I'm not saying there's not. There are seasons of sacrifice. But, but they come after seasons of replenishment and joy and wonder and faith and hope. So we have something to give in that season. And without self-care, we have nothing to give to the people. When I get like this, like I am right now, I want to 
shut off the world. I literally was telling people I'm borderline introvert, borderline extrovert. I do good in a crowd, but I need, I need time alone to replenish. That is not correct at all. I am a flaming extrovert whose life is out of control and needs alone time to get caught up on personal stuff because I've worn myself out with everything else. Oh my gosh, I'm an extrovert who's dysfunctional. Uh, th that's the problem. That's what I figured out in this pandemic. That, so that's the adjustments I'm trying to make. So mental me is where we steward our energy. What a life shoe. Man, what, 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 what drains you? You ever been in a conversation with somebody? You're literally in this conversation. 30 seconds in, you can feel your battery go do, 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 do. I mean, you can feel. You can feel. I was at the grocery store. Everywhere I go. So I'm like, got two items. Boop, 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 boop. And, and the guy in the next front of me needs to borrow my, my Ingalls reward card, you know? And I'm like, yeah, I got one here. And he uses it to scan and then starts telling me all his life's problems. And I'm like, no, dude, those are your problems, not mine. Not taking them today, getting my groceries and going. Do you know it's okay that in that moment, I have my own problems. I lost my mother-in-law this week. I lost a good friend this week. I, I, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not carrying a stranger's problems who in the first second of our introduction saw me as a source to dump on and pull from. And as a believer, I have the right to take care of myself too and so that I can care for other people. But I'm starting to see these patterns because as a pastor, you never run out of problems. Everybody's got problems. There's oh, plenty of problems. At some point, you got to say, I've done all I can do today. I got to take care of me. And so this whole concept of, of stress is, 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 I'm sorry, stewardship of our energy. So, so when I said that about mental health, mental health is processing experiences and information so that we can keep our focus and deal with stress so that we can make good decisions. So here, Dr. Marks 101, Dr. Jim Marks 101, that, that, that if you're dealing with somebody and their anxiety is a level seven or higher, they can't hear you. They can't see you. They, they can't cover. So when we get to a level seven of anxiety, we start making bad decisions. We, we misinterpret information. We, we, we misunderstand a circumstance of our life. And so what we've got to be able to do is help people, their stress come down past a level seven so their brain can kick in. Why is it that someone who is drowning in the ocean, that's high stress, that's stress level 12, not 10, they're drowning in the ocean, tries to drown the very lifeguard that's trying to save them. Their only hope because they can't think. Their stress is so high. And, and when we're dealing with mental health stuff, when uh, our stress is so high that we want to pull back or cope, we mental health issues come from you know, some of the symptoms of that you're struggling with mental health is sleeping too much or sleeping too little, eating too much or eating too little, hiding away from all civilization, hiding in the dark room away from people, dealing with addictive behavior, drinking too much, smoking too much, you know, doing drugs. It, we, oh, we're trying to compensate. We're trying to numb. We're trying to bring that anxiety down below a level seven. And, and it's important that we understand the stress. So I said a minute ago, we have to do two things. We have to, we have to be able to understand the circumstances we've experienced and also interpret information. Some of us have some experiences in our life that have been driving our whole life. There, there's a, there's a, a, a counseling strategy called uh, anchoring. And anchoring is a psychological condition that, that maybe you had trauma as a seven-year-old. And if you don't process that trauma as a seven-year-old, when you turn 40 and you get in an argument and that thing gets triggered, you go back to seven years old. And it's hard for people in your world to deal with you because in other areas of your life, you're still 40. It's just in that one area, you're still seven. You've not been healed of that. You've not been brought forth in that. So sometimes there can be triggers to our mental health that go all the way back to our childhood because we never understood an experience that we, that we walked through. And in this season of our life, we have more time to reflect, most of us, by the way, let me say this, a word for you is not necessarily a word for somebody else, and a word for somebody else is not necessarily a word for you. And I say that because we have people that are in a deep pause, and they're a little bit bitter because they want to get back to their life. We have other people that never got a pause, and they're a little bit bitter that they didn't get a day off, that they're working twice as hard as they ever worked before, and they wish they had a pause. And the two are two different realities, and we got to recognize and got to understand that. So mental me is stewarding our energy. In this pandemic, every single day, 
I get up and I say, where is my tank? I'm a three. What can I do to lower stress so that I don't have a negative? And what can I do to add something today to get a positive? My normal world, pre-pandemic, eternal optimist, is how much can I give away today? How much can I get done today? How many things on my to-do list can I get done today? In this season, where I'm struggling with depression, where I'm struggling with sadness, when production doesn't matter anymore, I'm saying, oh my gosh, what life's me? What, what, what could I do today to move my energy from a three to a four? What can I do that by the end of this week, I'm functioning at a seven and, and I can operate again? And, and, and I think for all of us, we've got to be able to figure out what are the inputs in our life? What are the things that, that um, the deposits, what are the deposits in our life? And then what are the things that take from our lives? And, and so we, mental me is where we steward our energy. I challenge you every single day. Three, what happened in the last couple hours that has drained two points off your tank? Uh, or or so we were outside, just some, right before this, uh, the people who were in the room, we were outside in the foyer, in a circle, and we were just, and our energy was just bubbling up, just bubbling up. We're so happy to be with people. And we were just sharing stories, and, and I was fussing, saying, why do you shoot a video so the rest of us could have watched that? And we're all just, just in each other. We're, we're practicing social distancing. We're behaving, but just standing in a circle with six people and just sharing our hearts and looking each other in the eyes, the energy just started coming up in the room. Uh, I, I, I'm, I'm running in this season. I'm doing some running. I don't run near the house. I've got plenty of places to run near the house. I drive 20 minutes to go to Lake Genaluska. Why? Because there are people there. There are people. i got to go see some people. I, I drove to the lake uh, day before yesterday, and two girls from our gym that's in my class were walking around, and, and I pulled up, and we just had a few minutes to process, to just, just talk about the death of Haven Payne and how precious a, a soul she is and how much she meant to us. And, and, and you need people that knew Haven and could celebrate Haven and process with you. And so in this season, I'm finding what, what are the things that life me? I hate running, but I, if I can run around the lake and at least see people, it sort of works for me. Okay, the last point, number four, I almost got ahead of myself on that one. Let me read this passage to you. Now, may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely. It's his job to do the sanctification, by the way. And may your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord cares about our spirit, our soul, and our body. So my last point is mental me manages who is on our team. Who is on our team. So... In this season, I'm paying attention to who are the people in my life that are on my team? Who are the father figures that, 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 uh, that speak into my life? Who are the mentors in my life? Who are my spiritual mothers that I go to for nurturing? And I'm not, I'm not ruling out my natural mother and father. I'm just thinking, who are the people that are on Team Nick? Who are, who are those people? And, 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 and if you don't have anybody, a counselor, a spiritual mother, a father, a mentor, I, I feel for you right now because all of us need some care. All of us need some nurturing. We need to nourish ourselves, but we need other people to help us too. Um, who are our assignments? You know, even in this pandemic, there are people that we're called to help. I, I've watched people. It's interesting. I have a lot of international friends. I have people in other countries that I'm friends with and didn't even know the names of my neighbors. And in this season, I'm watching people get to know the name of their neighbors because things have gotten very local lately. Uh, uh, so who are the people that are on your team? And, and I want to say, I, I think, uh, I'm going to challenge you, there are some people I'm talking to right now, you don't have enough people on your team. And the people you do have keep failing you because they can't make up for the people that's not on your team that's supposed to be on your team. When you play football, you get 11 people on your team. If you walk out there with four people, that's your fault. you got to get the other seven people on your team. you got to get a full team. You can't go out there with just four people. Because if you do, then you're going, I, I hear people say sometimes, family's all you got. Shouldn't be. Shouldn't be. No, no, no. Family's not all you got. Friends, you, friend, you can have friends too. You can have acquaintances. You can have partnership. When you say family's all I got, then you put a big load on your family to meet all your needs. When God wanted us to have lots of other spiritual moms and dads and people who are assignments in our life. So, so you got to make sure your team is full. Second of all, 
Make sure your team's up to date. There may be some people on your team that don't belong on your team anymore. The, 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 the season of life changed, and it's okay if they're not on your team. Doesn't mean they can't be your friend. Doesn't mean you can't see them every once in a while, but they're not the people that you give current information to. They're not people that can see who you are today and who you're becoming. See, sometimes you got to take an old voice out of your life to make room for someone new to speak life into you and help clarify who you are and where you're going. Uh, family's the worst for it. Family likes to keep defining who you used to be. Sometimes you need to bring some new people into your life that says, don't listen to that old voice. That old voice is not relevant anymore. Let me tell you who you are and who you become. Let me tell you when you're brilliant. Let me tell you something I love about you. Let me tell you something that you do and you do well. As I say all these things, you are responsible. You're, you're, you're the team captain of your own team. You have to decide. And in this pandemic, there are people who've gotten to you, and there's people that's not got to you. There's people that you had a relationship because you walked down the hall on Sunday morning and saw them for 30 seconds, but you don't have a relationship with them because you ain't talked to them in 10 weeks. We've been doing this for 10 weeks. Who's still on your team through the pandemic? Any new voices come in your life? Any new people through the pandemic? It's time for us, if we're going to talk about uh, unpacking our experiences and, and being able to understand the information that we're dealing with, and we're going to lower our stress and keep our focus, make good choices and decisions, we need a team of people around us. And, and there's some people that are very isolated right now. They don't have many friends. And there are people out there that, that haven't purposely built their team. And then there's some people out there that their team is not relevant anymore. And, and God wants to bring some new voices into your life. I, I'm, I'm pursuing a relationship right now. It's a weird one. <laughs> it's a weird one. I'll tell you about it on the backside of all this. But I'm pursuing a new relationship that I would have never pursued before except for this pandemic. And I'm, I'm, and I'm overlooking a bunch of differences because I think there's a rare opportunity there for me in my life in this season to grow and to understand the Lord more through this relationship. I'll let you know how that works out. Because sometimes you have to pursue a relationship. This person doesn't know me, and this person doesn't even want to have a relationship with me. I am pursuing them to see if they'll have a relationship with me. And uh, sometimes you've got to pursue your own people and recruit them and get them on your team. So I said all that to say that um, this is not my strength it's not my wheelhouse because of my energy, my eternal optimism, and my high capacity for product productivity. The last season was all about export. This season is, how are you doing? What lifes you? What drains you? Do you have the right people around you? Are you able to deal with your stress and lower it? Are you able to keep your focus? What's the new thing that God's doing in your life? And I want to say that you can't give away the peace you don't take care of. If you're not taking care of yourself, you're going to hide from people. You're not going to want to be around people. It's really important that we take care of ourselves in this season. So that's what I wanted to talk to you about today. Next week, we'll talk about emotional me. We'll talk about our emotional health. But today, I wanted to talk about mental me. And I want to finish right here, and I want to pray for all of us. But I specifically want to talk to you. You guys know I don't use fear, and I don't use manipulation. But this week, I lost somebody that I cared about suddenly, tragically, way too young. Life is precious. And I want to say two things to you. If you don't know Jesus Christ, today is the day of salvation. If you don't know Jesus, you're not promised tomorrow. We do not know what tomorrow looks like. And today is the day to make an eternal decision to have relationship with Jesus Christ. Second of all, I want to speak to those of you who know Jesus. You were not created to die. You were created to live. I'm asking you right now to ask Papa to teach you how to live that you could live the, the life he created you to have and not sit around waiting to suffer and to, to be punished and, and to do without, but that Jesus came that you might have life and have it abundantly and then have eternal life. And I'm asking you to consider, are you living the life that Jesus wanted you to live? So I'm going to pray for both of those people right now. And if you'll just pray along with me, Lord Jesus, I recognize that I need eternal life. I recognize that tomorrow's not promised to me. I recognize that all you've asked of me was to believe that Jesus is the Son of God, that he came to take my place on the cross to pay the price for my sin, that I might receive eternal life from him and become a brand new person. And by believing and confessing with the words of my mouth, Jesus enters my heart, saves me from my sin, and becomes Lord and Savior.
I pray, Lord, that now that Jesus has become our life, that we would find abundant life. That we would find out what lifes us, what, 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 what causes us to dream with passion and, 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 and is, are filled to joy and fullness. That we are running after the dreams that you've placed in our hearts and our lives. That we give up this martyr mentality. That if you ask us to be martyrs, we'll be a martyr. If you ask us to sacrifice, we will. But in the meantime, we're going to pursue life, joy, your love, your delight, your desire for us, the dream you have for us. And we're going to fill ourselves with the fullness that Jesus took death that we might have life. Help us with that today. And Lord, I do pray for those who are struggling in this season, who are struggling with isolation and loneliness, sadness, hopelessness, depression. I'm asking God that you would come in in that place and meet them right there and minister to them, that they would not have to turn to a drug or alcohol or to bad behavior, but they would find you're the source of all hope and all healing, and that you'd be more real to them than ever. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Guys, I love you. I appreciate you. It's okay to say you're sad. It's okay to say you're struggling. It's okay if you're not got it all together right now. We're in this together. Find a friend, love on one another, help each other out. Hey, before I leave, don't forget to go on newcovenantchurch.com. Click on that connect button. I'm praying over the prayer request today. So please give me a quick prayer request. If you're there today and maybe something I said touched a part of your heart and you stirred something up, if you'll leave your phone number, an altar minister will call you today and minister to you. God bless you guys. Take care of yourself. You're important to me.